This is the University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures and talks given on the campus of Iowa State University at Ames. Tonight, Justice William O. Douglas speaks on points of rebellion. I'm uh, going to uh, talk to you tonight about three uh, related subjects that deal with the sources of some, I think, of the, of the deep trouble that uh, we're in, uh, domestically speaking. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> trying to expose some of these problems uh, and with a view not of uh, providing uh, uh, specific remedies, but trying to air them because we are, we are really in, in, in serious difficulty. The first I'm going to talk about is the uh, redress of grievances, uh, which is now very much in the news because, uh, not for the first time, but in increasing frequency, frequency this uh, redress of grievances is <clears throat> being used by the poor and by the discontent and by the minorities in demonstrations and parades. Uh, one of the reasons why <clears throat> this is in the, presents new problems to the states is because in 1931, Hughes in the Stromberg case from California held that the First Amendment is applicable to the states. Uh, <clears throat> since therefore 1931, uh, it was it would be unconstitutional to arrest the man for disorderly conduct because you uh, didn't like him because he was making an unpopular speech and resisted uh, <clears throat> the officer when the officer tried to haul him off the platform or for breach of the peace or, or loit loitering or trespass for suppressing an unpopular minority or punishing an unpopular individual. Uh, <clears throat> I don't say that happens in Iowa, but it happens in some states. Uh, it, so we, 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 we get a, a whole group of cases of that character that are coming through the courts. And the, these, these rights, the right to speak, the right to petition, the right to go to the state house, <clears throat> uh, these are very basic in our system and are now being exercised to a very great extent by the minorities. The Negro problem is a problem of great, in, great depth. A uh, part of it goes back to <clears throat> um, our court, 1903. The Negroes came and um, in the Giles case and asked for, they, they were, had a class action and they, this was a suit in the federal court to require local registrars to end their discriminatory practices in the South and register them as qualified voters. And in an opinion written by one of my heroes, Holmes, for a ma majority of six, he held that their Negro's remedy was not in the courts, but in the political realm, which may be philosophically sound, but as a practical matter, 1903 in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, what were the Negro's political remedies? It took, it took 60 years, 60 years for the Negroes to get a Civil Rights Act through Congress that, that gave them machinery for asking, but the court refused to give them in 1903. If that had been done, we would have, in, in 1903, as the minority wanted, and as I'm sure later courts would have done, uh, <clears throat> you, we wouldn't have had these two generations of this festering problem that's now erupting. Uh, <clears throat> The uh, condition of the, of the Negro throughout the country is, is alarmingly difficult because the average income of the professionally trained Negro is lower than the average for the Negro unskilled labor, which is a measure of the vast discrimination across the country that exists against the Negro lawyer, the dentist, engineer, and so on. So we have, my friends, <clears throat> in that, that sector alone, a tremendous distance to go, not in putting up houses, 
putting, changing attitudes and frames of mind. Uh, <clears throat> the welfare system that we, that we have at the present time uh, costs about uh, $2 billion a, <clears throat> a year. Uh, <clears throat> we have a common practice in the East uh, to have these midnight raids without search warrants on the houses of the poor to see if there is a man in the house. And if there is a man in the house, then welfare stops because uh, the, the woman is not as dependent as she says she was. Forty states require a year's residence for a person to get welfare, a, a provision that was recently struck down in Connecticut as being unconstitutional. But needy people, we know, do not shop around for welfare. <clears throat> but to wait in the state, th these are festering conditions. Uh, the traditional forms of property are largely being displaced by government largesse. Some of it's in the form of social security, unemployment insurance, veterans benefits, aid to dependent children, state and local welfare. All of which uh, last year equaled about $80 billion. About 20% of uh, our labor force across the country now receives its primary income from the government and a great deal of the business of this country has this underpinning now in government contracts, in war contracts, in Pentagon contracts. These are vast subsidies. Uh, down in Washington, there are little contracting officers, majors or captains or lieutenants who debar contractors from entering into government contract merely by stamping them uh, with the words blacklist because they don't like them. And that disqualifies them for, from government business for a stated term without prior notice or specification of reasons or opportunity to be heard. <clears throat> uh, Holmes once uttered a, a careless dictum that no one has a constitutional right to be a policeman. Now we're getting, uh, <clears throat> with all these people dependent upon government income for living, we're getting the attachment of conditions to this largesse. Uh, <clears throat> uh, did you uh, protest the government's policy in Vietnam? Uh, are you therefore entitled, if you did, are you therefore entitled any longer to your pension? Uh, these uh, sorts of things are <clears throat> working at the bottom of our society, in the bottom 20 to 30 percent, they're part of the tremendous eruption that is taking place. Uh, <clears throat> up to 1963, uh, the, uh, the poor had no right to counsel in felony cases. Uh, many states took care of it, of course, but uh, there are 14 or more didn't. Uh, <clears throat> that was changed as a result of uh, one, of our, one of our belated uh, decisions, and they're now getting uh, assistance in felony cases, but there's still no constitutional right for the poor to get <coughs> uh, counsel in misdemeanor cases or in civil cases. Down in the ghettos, uh, <coughs> you'll find uh, high-pressure salesmen at work. They have very special skills in selling to the poor. The hidden carrying charges are common. Uh, credit life insurance uh, is piled on. One $800 purchase that I came across involved life insurance premium of $215. These credit sales are often excluded from usury laws. Loan sharks flourish. New York City obtain, uh, obtaining as much as 1,000% interest a year. <clears throat> One New York uh, outfit had six names and four locations in, in two years. While the buyers have remedies, in many cases they have no lawyers. Most suits, 97% uh, <clears throat> in the Harlem, result in default judgments. And a deficiency judgment is often double the debt, so the prop any property can be sold and wages can be garnished. But uh, out east, we have the practice of the sellers transferring their paper to finance companies, so they claim it as holders in due course, which means that they are immune from uh, all the defenses that would be available against the seller of the merchandise. A few states have passed laws uh, <coughs> removing that uh, defense of holder in due course. 
but even those new laws uh, <coughs> uh, deprive the, uh, the buyer of its protection if he has not complained to the finance company in a very short time. Uh, these uh, uh, slums, these ghettos, one of the uh, richest investments in America, they, the dwellers often pay as much for housing as does the middle class. <clears throat> and when the space is not habitable, ha habitable, where does a tenant complain? You go into New York City and you find five different departments with 19 sub uh, subdivisions who process complaints. A rat department, a defective wiring department, so on. But how would a person without a lawyer know where to go? In many of our large cities, landlords are given grace periods that extend up to 18 months. And the fine, the, the fine is nominal and cheaper than making the repairs. Why doesn't the tenant withhold the rent? Well, in some states, the, it's not a, 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 a legal practice because the lease is a conveyance of a right to possess space and not a contract. And the landlord's covenant to repair is therefore separate from the, land, the tenant's duty to pay rent. Uh, <clears throat> while there's some change in this process, the practice has been to enforce these clauses that are very onerous to the tenant. The tenant who does not sign a lease is subject to a 30-day notice to quit, which he gets if he reports a code violation. The summary eviction processes are <clears throat> very onerous, especially on the poor. In public housing, uh, applicants are screened for their morals and for the character of their private lives. Uh, <clears throat> eviction from public housing is uh, more often than not deemed to promote the public interest. But the review of cases involving eviction because the tenant espoused an unpopular cause is very difficult to litigate and the check restraints on that are very ineffective. Uh, <clears throat> we need uh, uh, Iowa, New Jersey, and other states have responded to our court's ruling and uh, now have uh, fine systems worked out to appoint lawyers to represent the poor. The Economic Opportunity Act uh, sets up uh, agencies called the Neighborhood Legal Services. And they are now in uh, nearly 50 states and they, uh, they have uh, uh, hundreds of different units. They are handling about 400,000 to 600,000 cases a year for the poor. But the American Bar Association recently estimates that there are 14 million cases a year that need lawyers. Uh, the government, federal government spends now $30 million a year, and the American Bar says, 300 million is needed. The neighborhood legal services in the East are tendering court such issues as this. Why should tenants pay rent until landlords bring their housing up to legal standards? Why should tenants <coughs> in public housing units not be able to force the federal agency to eliminate rats? Why should welfare agents not be barred from raiding the homes of welfare aid recipients unless they have valid search warrants? Why should not a finance company's pound of flesh contract be tested for legality in the courts? Prior to the advent of the neighborhood legal services, about seven out of 10 poor people when sued in the courts never appeared with the result that they had default judgments. When the uh, legal services lawyers appeared and started winning cases, the landlord and finance company interests, instead of winning uh, hundreds of cases every morning, began to face the awful specter that their oppressive regime might be toppling down. And so neighborhood legal services these days is heavily engaged in litigation. And only two weeks ago, there was a amendment offered on the floor of the Senate to bar the use of these NLS funds uh, to bring any action against any federal agency or against any state or political subdivision, which means that neighborhood legal services could not contest welfare claims or prosecute welfare claims, could not defend illegal arrests, and so on, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> these problems <clears throat> are, are going to get much, much worse, not only because there's very little attention being made to them, all there is talk about building new places for these people to live, 
But it's not the place alone, it's the conditions that pertain to the condition of their living. <clears throat> These are going to get much worse because we're coming into a period where disemployment as well as unemployment is going to be a very important factor. We know now that the private sector in America will be unable to take care of all the employment needs. There's no reasonably predictable rate of growth in industry which is equal to the rate of technological disemployment. But these uh, new problems of disemployment produce uh, bewildering problems. Disemployment is not restricted to the lower unskilled classes. We know that even some management personnel has become obsolete. The new computer jobs go to the younger people. The older folks unversed in computer management are now slipping down the ladder. Are we about to face a situation where a large proportion of the middle class is also permanently disemployable? Those with the greatest education and the greatest creative capacity, of course, have futures that are assured. But the leisure groups will be those who have been trained to deal with so-called structured situation in which the machine can work more efficiently. What institutions will control or own the plant or the plants that will give us the new and effortless supply of abundance? It'll be some form of collective security. What kind of collective security? And will that collective security that will arrive here have in it the ingredients of liberty and freedom and respect for the dignity of the individual <clears throat> that we've all cherished, or will it uh, be of a totalitarian stripe? Allied to this uh, problem has been the, uh, the search in recent years for the ideological stray. Those of you who have read history know that the kings have always looked for subversive people. That's why the crime of constructive treason was invented. The crime that <coughs> consisted of hoping that the old boy, the king, would die. Uh, <coughs> men were executed for thinking that and later for merely uttering treasonable words. And that's why we have that uh, strict provision of treason in our constitution. And the kings were fearful of treason and the theologians were bent on stamping out heresy. These loyalty tests uh, go way back to 1778. We've had them in uh, various stages, various degrees of intensity, various forms from the <coughs> beginning. Uh, Congress was uh, continuously working on this problem under the main impetus of the Dyes Committee in the 40s and they got around even to attaching riders to appropriation bills that prohibited the payment of federal salaries to certain designated people who were listed by name. And they brought uh, action to recover their salaries and our court held a course that they could recover their salaries because that law was, uh, met all the full requirements of a bill of attainder which is prohibited by the Constitution. 1947, uh, Truman launched the S Loyalty Security Program. That's the beginning. Then 1953, when Eisenhower was elected, the thing was tightened up. You remember the 1952 campaign that <coughs> Washington was soft on communism? Well, what happened when they came in in 53 was to broaden <coughs> the dismissal from loyalty to security and to define security to cover a multitude of sins. Uh, <clears throat> and then the second thing they did was to immediately suspend a person who was charged with being disloyal or a poor security risk. So immediately he was unemployed, off the payroll. And if he lived in Des Moines, Iowa or Ames, Iowa, he usually had to go to Chicago or Washington, D.C. to defend it trial wouldn't come up for three months, how would he raise the money, how would he hire a lawyer, who would be his witnesses, and so on. Uh, and the third thing they did was to provide that even though he had been cleared by the security board, uh, he would not be reinstated unless the, the man at the head of the agency 
decided that his reemployment would be clearly consistent with the national interest. These uh, loyalty security investigations were in general not concerned with overt acts damaging to the United States. Uh, they were prying into the minds and secret affairs of employees. This new treason that we have tolerated that developed in the last 20 years relates almost exclusively to private thoughts and opinion. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, charges and hearings are replete with references to and probing into opinions about international relations, religion, marital relations, taste in music, art, the theater, opinions about the possibility of coexistence, do you believe in the United States, United Nations, the rule of law, opinions about the loyalty program. Uh, <clears throat> at one point, anyone supporting the Negro struggle for equality was immediately suspect. Dorothy Bailey, who was before us, was vigorously questioned, and she never got back on the payroll. Whether she thought the Red Cross should mix white and colored blood, espousing the cause of the underdog and the underprivileged has raised the eyebrows of the, of the bureaucrat. Uh, <clears throat> an employee's statement that he believed that the hearings were more of a threat to civil liberties than communism because they infringed on free speech was the basis of a charge that the employee was in sympathetic association with communists. One board thought, <clears throat> and I thought this was very significant, that this employee was a poor risk because his, his wife slept on a board. <laughs> and they thought something was wrong with her head. Actually, something was wrong with her back. Uh, another employee was let out because his, his wife obviously was a subversive because she wore Levi's at cocktail parties. Uh, and everybody knows that that's a telltale sign. <coughs> uh, <clears throat> there's been a wave of dismissals in the Deep South of teachers who were opposed to segregation. Uh, discharges of teachers have gone off on the expression of unpopular ideas about sex or literary works. A faculty member who'd been given the leave of absence to serve in the state legislature was not reappointed because his voting record there was too liberal. <clears throat> a faculty member was fired for signing a petition for amnesty for those convicted under the Smith Act. And as you know, we recently had the case of Bond, a Negro in Georgia, whom they would not seat because he was opposed to our policy in Vietnam. And of course, that action was held to be unconstitutional. Uh, <clears throat> behind these loyalty programs, and, or emerging from them, was a new conception of loyalty, totally unlike any loyalty America has known. The new loyalty is an unquestioning, uncritical, automatic acceptance of what's going on. And loyalty in the American dream, as I see it, is a creative, uh, dynamic commitment to the American ideal of diversity and exploration. The new loyalty did, did not look upon the United States as an unfinished dream, striving to fruition, but as a completed product. And anybody that suspected it was suspect, uh, who, who was uh, uh, <clears throat> suspected that it was complete and who criticized it was, was suspected of disloyalty. This, my friends, is tremendously crippling in this day of world revolution. Because <clears throat> what this country needs more than anything else are innovators, those with new and unorthodox views. But those are the people who were forced out of government employment or who never wanted to get in because they feared, the, in light of what happened, that the shackles might be applied to them. These, uh, this does not mean that uh, we should need to sit back supinely while public institutions are taken over by people who use them or may use them for unlawful ends. The trouble starts when government levels off against an employee and points an accusing finger at him. <clears throat> then grave constitutional questions are raised, both in terms of procedure and in terms of the First Amendment. Once the investigator has only the conscience of government as a guide, the conscience can become ravenous, as Cromwell bent on destroying Thomas Moore said in A Man for All Seasons. You know, a century ago, uh, 
an offbeat nonconformist who was plagued and pilloried at home, could turn west, settle down in Ames, Iowa, and find a new life on the frontier. <laughs> but now there's no escape. We're increasingly inter interdependent. There's no retreat. I can assure you, my friends, that there's a dossier on every one of you somewhere in Washington, D.C. What your views are on Vietnam? Did you parade pictures of you parading, protesting, copies of letters you've written, your attitudes, your grades, your magazines you read? <clears throat> this uh, thing can make a PhD worthless overnight. We had a man before us by the name of Vitarelli. <clears throat> Vitarelli had five, a wife and five kids. He was a PhD. Under Eisenhower, he was suspended for being a poor security risk. He was an educator in the Solomon Islands and the Mandates. And <clears throat> he went to 44 different colleges looking for a job as a suspended employee. And even his alma mater turned him down because what college would want to get mixed up with a man who was charged with being a subversive? The endowments would drop off and the foundation grants would drop off and the whole college or university would be suspect. Uh, Vitarelli ended up working for five years as a section hand on a railroad to support his family. He won his case in our court and got <clears throat> all the back pay. But think of it. How many could do that? Most of them did it. Not, uh, did not. 95% dropped out. They couldn't face it. They didn't want to. Uh, to, to they couldn't afford it. Uh, some of them became millionaires uh, selling real estate. But uh, <clears throat> many of these were just uh, ruined, crushed lives. Uh, <clears throat> in these days, uh, the individual becomes increasingly subservient to the straight state and increasingly helpless before it. We'd always assume that diversity, not conformity, was our ideal. So the search for this ideological stray has been contrary to the very hypothesis upon which our Constitution is founded. If we are to maintain the barriers that make for strong, independent people, we must draw the line between action for which the individual may be exposed and thoughts for which he may never can be or should be. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, these uh, <clears throat> are the issues, my friends, around which the great debates in Washington are beginning to take place. Big Brother in the form of an increasingly powerful government and in an increasingly powerful private sector will soon pile the records high with reasons why privacy should give way to national security, to law and order, to efficiency of operation, to scientific advancement and the like. <clears throat> the cause of privacy, I think, will be won or lost essentially in legislative halls and in constitutional assembly. If it is won, this, if we succeed, if, if the battle is won, this pluralistic society of ours will experience a, a great spiritual renewal. But if it is lost, as I'm afraid it will, because of the tendency of our people to bow and submit, we will have written our own prescription for mediocrity and conformity. have been listening to another in a series of lectures and talks given on the campus of Iowa State University at Ames. Today, Justice William O. Douglas spoke on points of rebellion. University Lecture is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.